uh, why don't you just have yourself introduced and tell us a bit about your work? Uh, yes, so I am currently uh, an associate professor of economics um, at the University of Sussex. Um, I um, didn't start as an economist. I was an engineer and then did an MBA. I think like Nirat did, um, and I had uh, a number of different career uh, choices uh, play out briefly before I settled in academia. So I, my research is uh, largely what you call applied microeconomics. So this is uh, based on application of econometric techniques to, in my case, questions of policy relevance or questions that interest or motivate me. So, um, and I think the, uh, the paper we're going to talk about today falls squarely in that realm. I think it's, a, it's an important policy issue um, and requires uh, a body of evidence, rigorous body of evidence, um, so that that can be taken to policymakers and the media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, we've read, I mean, we'd read some of your work and we found your work on red, urban rental housing discrimination based on Delhi it was really interesting. And I, I think it, Neelith has mentioned it also inspired our Open the Door campaign where we talk about discrimination in free housing services. Can you tell us about your motivation to study urban rental housing discrimination and like how did it come to you? Like how did you decide that you're going to research on this particular theme? So there have been uh, some uh, high profile media reports of, uh, of Muslim tenants being turned away. These, um, are, uh, these are actually professionals, uh, well-paid professionals. So it is a bit shocking to read about this. This was, I think, 2013, 2014. I had come across uh, Professor Thorat's paper in other context. Um, and it so happens that my co-author, Shogutu Datta, who is now at Ideas 42 had earlier done a paper on labor market discrimination um, involving caste and religion. And this was focused on the, uh, the call center and the IT back office space that is opening up in India in the early 2000s. Since a lot of recruitment for that also happens uh, online and via newspapers. So we thought that this would be, uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, how much of this was going on um, and because you're both abroad, um, actually, uh, the logical way to do it was to look uh, through the web, if you could actually do it sitting here in uh, the UK and the US. Yeah. Um, so in reference to the discussion and in reference to the paper, uh, your uh, research is like, it's quite designed uh, to implicate policy level changes. So uh, what was the intent behind it? And what do you think are the key policy level um, implications of your research that you intended to make? So I, so I think our, our goal was fairly modest. Uh, it was just to make sure that uh, we could provide um, experimental, which would mean rigorous, because it's a little hard to deny that what you observe in experiment is uh, merely correlation or anecdotal. So the idea was to, uh, put together what we would think was perhaps the cleanest, most rigorous evidence that uh, even in middle and upper middle class uh, housing markets, uh, we are seeing a systematic pattern of uh, discrimination. Um, we did not really have any illusions that this would lead to a policy change on its own. We just thought it would be um, maybe spur more research, more debate, uh, get media coverage, which it did. Um, and as a growing body of evidence is built up, you have response at the policy level. Um, I actually am not sure that in a context like India, it's enough to have just a legal framework um, that's going to work. I think it has to be coupled with social change. So some of the stuff that you guys are doing actually is probably arguably as promising, if not more, than putting laws on the book. Because we know that state capacity in India is very weak. So enforcement would be an issue. Um, so I don't think it's going to just come from the government. Although certainly I'm not denying the fact that you, you do want a signal from the government and the courts on where they stand, because that does tend to curb some excesses and make people moderate their behavior, so. Yeah. Um, so like gathering from what you just said, you use the web-based audit technique to conduct the research and so we're both abroad. Uh, what do you think is the relevance of such techniques uh, to be employed in research, especially in the current times and all under quarantine? 
So, uh, well, the quarantine is a huge and somewhat unfortunate natural experiment. Um, there's going to be tons of papers on, uh, on this, uh, not all about web-based uh, use. But um, actually, preceding the quarantine, the last decade or so, a lot of um, economic transactions have moved online. Um, so the so-called gig economy and a lot of these intermediaries who are bringing together uh, suppliers and uh, consumers. So housing markets is one, but you also have labor markets, you have finance, credit markets, you have um, uh, uh, short-term housing rentals like Airbnb, which actually has faced its own set of issues with, uh, with discrimination. You have discrimination in the taxi, the cab sourcing market with, uh, I think there were some cases in India where consumers refused a Muslim driver. Um, so um, I think, just because so many transactions are moving online, um, there is uh, a lot of scope to, uh, for discrimination to manifest itself online. Uh, so, and then there's a corresponding scope for us to study how this manifests itself and what are the consequences, what are the new equilibria and uh, what kind of policies should be put in place and how uh, folks should generally should respond or understand what the, how the market would then respond in turn to those policies. So I think it's yeah. a fascinating way to appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, this was actually my second question as a part of the previous question. Uh, what are the other discrimination related streams uh, which can be studied through web based, web -based method? Since you just mentioned that with, you know, a lot of transactions are happening online. So what do you think are other streams that we could possibly use web based method to study? I think you could use many of the, uh, in most of the domains I have run through in the last minute or so. So um, uh, lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, even business to consumer lending, um, labor markets, um, there, are, there are the uh, standard recruitment uh, websites where you can apply online. Um, and it's somewhat anonymous, but there's also the um, gig economy markets like TaskRabbit in the US. Um, I think India has something, I don't know the name of the website, but a lot of uh, domestic help is hired through this. Um, you guys would know. Yeah, urban, um, yeah. urban, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I think many of these settings um, would be uh, lending themselves uh, to this kind of research. Another example, I think is gonna go very fast. A friend of mine runs uh, a group called Tribeca, and uh, which is based in Kolkata, which places uh, nursing care uh, with elderly people. Some of this is very limited, just getting them to doctors and getting prescriptions to home, and others is actually more intrusive in the sense that you actually place a nurse at home. And so you can imagine hiring nurses there and what kind of preferences come into play. So because this is a high, this is a trust issue, right? So here, trust is critical. So all of this is, uh, all of these are domains where I think you're going to have um, opportunities to um, to study um, uh, preferences. Um, I won't call them discriminations necessarily because it could be statistical or taste based, and we might discuss that in a bit. But uh, definitely see how people's preferences over groups come into play and what the outcome is for the markets. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor. That's very helpful. Uh, my next question is of sort of uh, very general in nature. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, when the number one consequence or the primary consequence of housing based discrimination leads to ghettoization on religious or caste lines. But there is also an emerging narrative that, oh, uh, we want to ghettoize ourselves, the concept, like, as in uh, the creation of such enclaves are voluntary in nature. What do you think? What is what is your perspective on this on this well, dichotomy? I, I need to understand this a little more. I'm not going to take a very strong stance on this. However, my prior is that it looks voluntary, but it's not. It's really a, a, a constraint in disguise. When the dominant or the majority group it may not be a numerical majority, but the dominant group in terms of holding uh, most of the levers of uh, capital and power. Um, has in-group preferences and therefore discriminates, quote unquote, against an out-group, then the rational response of the out-group is to form its own, quote unquote, ghetto or its own market or its own platform. And it's not at all clear that that, when you step back, is a voluntary response, it's a rational response. 
Um, so I would be careful in arguing that, um, that it is just two groups deciding to develop in parallel. It's not as simple as that. So um, if the thought experiment here is that if discrimination was outlawed and enforced and socially unacceptable, you would not see these ghettos emerging parallel. Uh, they could still emerge as a response, even in the absence of discrimination, but my trial is they would not emerge because by and large folks want to sort themselves, I think more along the lines of close to work, close to hospitals, close to um, main commute routes. So preferences in emerging middle class India, whether you are Muslim or Hindu, are not that heterogeneous. You want good education for your kids, you want to be close to a hospital, you have little parents, you want to be close to work, you want a safe neighborhood, clean neighborhood. So wherever those are available, you would have people competing to get to those. If some groups are shut out, they will, it will look like they're developing ghettos, but that's the best they can do in response to uh, a situation where they cannot actually break in the mainstream enclave. So I would not, I think the voluntary thing is, uh, it's a bit of a straw man. Um, I think you have to think about, look behind it and see whether that's actually, um, uh, it's just, I think it's a constrained optimization problem then for the out group, really. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, now I'll just go with one question related to this and then, then uh, pass it back to you. So, uh, so Vikram, uh, there's obviously a lot of research around ghettoization, right? Uh, from your vantage point as an economist, uh, can you just sort of share also for the people who see this, uh, what are the uh, economic, uh, what are the different ways in which, let's say, value gets is destroyed because of ghettoization? So, I mean, um, so... I don't know if economists have the best response to this. Um, uh, Neoclassical economists will say that um, if it's all taste-based, then market forces should eventually dissolve this. I think there's, a, there's definitely a cost to social cohesion. There is a cost to, um, there's a cost you could cast in terms of the trade framework in the sense that the best candidates um, for jobs, for instance, because they're locked in ghettos, firms do not necessarily hire the best. They operate in a constrained subset. So there are costs that way. Um, so a, the, a simple example would be you want to hire the best programmer, but if your uh, pool is only upper caste Hindus uh, because they are an easy commute distance to your office in Gurgaon or in CP, well, you're already pulling from a smaller pool. Uh, it could be that in labor surplus markets like India, it's already a big enough pool, but I'm not convinced when you have fast economic growth that uh, there is not a cost to cutting out large segments of the population. This is the same argument you use for gender-based discrimination. Half your workforce is not able to tap into opportunities. There is a cost. The best folks are not being matched to the best opportunities. And there's a huge friction in the market, then, which is an economic cost. There's also, of course, social cohesion, um, which, is, which can then manifest itself in instability, lack of trust, right? So, and there are costs to those because then people have to put in place security measures or contractual measures because lack of trust is very corrosive um, to an economy. Uh, again, I think sociologists and maybe other folks have thought about this somewhat better than economists, these social capital trust issues. So it's uh, for economics, it's still an area that's considered a tad exotic. So thanks. Yeah. Back to you, Sandra. Yeah. yeah. So um, gathering from this conversation, I just wanted to add on if other measures like say better education, employment, um, or health benefits, would that be able to moderate the level of discrimination that happens in religious lines? So um, again, I would like to see more research on that. Um, the fact that you're seeing this emerge in our, um, our uh, paper, I think, sampled ads from Gurgaon, largely. And so this is an upper middle class setting. And um, the fact you're seeing this manifest, uh, these, you saw a clear pattern of discrimination manifest itself in this setting. It's not immediately obvious to me that just um, growing uh, affluence, education, health, uh, professionalism is enough to, to counter uh, this thing. That said, um, I don't know, maybe in more traditional neighborhoods, 
the ghettoization again i don't know it's a complex picture in india so some of the ghettoization has was partition driven some of it has emerged in the last 10 15 years there is there are papers um somit jha from stanford is a good guy to look at i don't know if you know his research he shows for instance that in some of the traditional port cities and trading centers in india because hindus and muslims had to work together for business reasons um so hindus supplying supplying capital and the muslims supplying labor you tended to see the riots were less frequent and when they happened they were uh, more quickly tamped down through community uh, groups so uh, i won't say that tradition traditionally there's been a big divide and now modern modernity is going to mitigate it's not as simple a picture as that and again uh, yeah i i i don't want to go out of my uh, knowledge base here i don't know i think there's a rich literature by historians and sociologists on this and also some economists to study history um, so i think it's um, all i can say is that it's not quite as simple as progress will be a magic wand that will wish away discrimination at least the evidence we've seen so far the time series evidence or the cross sectional evidence in india doesn't suggest it's as simple a picture as that um so and it's a bit of a chicken egg problem right if you have ghettoization you're going to have disparate outcomes in employment health and education so it it's kind of a feedback loop so it's not obvious that it's going to be uh, broken easily no no um there was a statement in your paper which i thought was very interesting and i would love to hear more from you on this i'll just read out the statement it says uh, there are important questions about how discrimination manifest uh, itself in online settings that facilitate anonymity so i thought it was really interesting and i it, it would love to hear a little bit more about this yes yeah, so it is driven partly by the contrast between our study and thorax uh, results um so because his study involved uh, also an audit but it involved uh, actors quote and quote going to landlords and masquerading as types caste or religion types so there uh, the landlord i was being observed that uh, the tenant quote and quote the actor was being observed so they were mutually observing each other so it's a, that's not an anonymous setting our setting is very anonymous cuz um, you there's no face to face encounter in fact there was not even a phone call we never picked up the phone calls so in this setting i mean a natural question is whether landlords are free or free to indulge in their prejudices so um, i think in the context of delhi for some landlords it would not matter they would if they do not want a muslim tenant they would say so on your face and they would not respond to an ad or say so on the phone however there might be a group so soft prejudices who are unwilling to uh, say this on the face but are in you know behind their normative the web they are comfortable there's no psychic cost really of indulging in this thing so so it's kind of a behavioral question in some sense i think the anonymity leads to uh, potentially important changes in the way prejudice is expressed it also could lead to interesting behavioral changes on the part of the um, applicant because um, because it's anonymous they may feel that at least we'll get a call back and once we talk maybe that barrier drops the landlord might say all right he is muslim but he sounds like a very nice young man he's employed in a good company and so right so that is um, so um, i i i mean i i don't know i think it's another avenue for very fruitful research to see uh, if you had the idle experiment would be if you could contrast uh, uh, behavior market behavior that's uh, relevant to discrimination in a anonymous setting and in a non anonymous setting and see what differences emerge in those two settings um i mean also enforcement is a little trickier in a non in an anonymous setting so it's a little harder um to uh, because a landlord could simply say well i didn't reply to those numbers i was busy All right yeah. so and in a non anonymous setting with people having mobile phones recording it be very different right so again there's all these differences that's what i meant by uh the difference between them Uh, at least building off that uh, sorry sir go ahead finish your question i have another one or two questions related to this but but go ahead no you could go ahead and then i'll just add on data okay great uh, okay so two uh, sort of somewhat uh, related questions the first is 
this whole idea of actually not uh, uh, so there being some uh, self regulated uh, i think behavior uh, if if it's not anonymous completely uh, a lot of the times we hear that people say we don't give out houses to people who eat non veg right so, so they using that whole thing to couch maybe uh their prejudice towards a religion let's say muslims or a whole ethnicity let's say people from the northeast and i suspect there's some parallel there between the uh, observed behavior and the true sort of preference uh, uh, and it plays out in a certain way in uh, anonymous versus uh, uh, face to face settings but but i am just curious to uh, hear your perspectives on this whole non veg uh, versus muslims versus northeast is there some uh, excuse being uh, made there or what's going on so um i suspect it is it's um it is a um, it definitely seems to be uh but well, okay, i i will definitely it seems to me that it is um a socially acceptable pretext that is being used um to indulge your prejudice um uh, that said uh, we know that there are groups of in particular hindus who have very strict dietary requirements so um i have heard anecdotally um through friends and media reports of um uh, say societies in mumbai shutting out northeastern folks or even folks from bengal because they eat they're known to be non vegetarian we don't want that so um uh, i think in some cases it is definitely just a pretext uh, to shut out muslims for instance it's possible that the landlord who says uh to a muslim on his face or over the phone sorry uh we don't uh, let out to non veg tenants will let out to a punjabi tenant who cooks chicken um it's possible right uh, again um uh, this is actually one of the avenues we had wanted to explore we haven't gotten to that because both shogat and i had other priorities in the intervening years but we wanted to see whether we could tease out how much of this insistence on uh on diet requirements is uh, merely a pretext of outgroup discrimination versus it actually exists in the sense people are very fussy regardless of who the and that into so i haven't seen any any good research on it i have just seen discussions about it i don't know if you know of any good research on this no i mean nothing that is immediately there with us uh, the other question i had from which is related this was uh, so this whole anonymous versus a certain behavior uh so if you look at it uh, renting a house is like a two stage process right so you have the first meeting at least a two stage there could be multiple stages in this whole process the first stage is where uh, the initial conversation takes place and then there's a decision and then the discussion could move to the second and the subsequent stages uh, let's say where commercials get discussed or the paper gets signed so it's, it's a multi stage process and where buyers could shut down the process at that stage right uh, and in this case uh, uh, there is a difference in the way uh so there's some difference in shutting down that process earlier or later based on anonymous versus uh, in person sort of settings i wonder if there are some uh, uh, not not for maybe multi stage processes but there are many processes in the world with a single stage right that decision itself uh, is the decision is the final decision right uh, so it could be about let's say who to pass on if i am a hiring manager and my job is to just uh, say yes or no and then it goes to the second level of hiring in my company so my prejudice at that stage would determine whether the, that that thing proceeds and, and the subsequent stages are not with me so in that kind of a scenario what are the uh, i mean what are the design tweaks we could make uh, i am talking very abstract uh, what are the kinds of design tweaks that could be made uh, to make sure that the real behavior is uh, uh, is close to the idealized social behavior socially acceptable behavior what uh could we tweak about these processes so uh, to just to make sure that i understand your where your questions coming from so imagine that uh, we have um hiring for a job position and there is a gatekeeper yeah and you see the gatekeeper is prejudiced um so in that sense uh, it may be that the person who makes the final hiring decision is not but there is is a one filter ahead which is only letting through a selective stream yeah. and it would also be yeah is that is that where your uh, exactly and the decision that gatekeeper would come to would vary based on whether that whole settings are anonymized or is it in person so i i am that situation generalized happens in multiple domains i would imagine jobs is just one domain so what do we do okay so there are two uh, two uh, important dimensions here one is um that you have a gatekeeper who has different preferences from the hiring manager the hiring manager may be totally 
agnostic about group identity. All she cares about is the fit with the job, the merit. But the gatekeeper has uh, different preferences. And then you're saying the gatekeeper employ, could employ two technologies. One is anonymous and one is in person. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so I haven't given that much thought. Um, it, your last question, the, the, you end off that question by saying, what design tweaks could you envisage which yeah, and if, especially if they became part of policy points, if regulation, if there was enough research showing that uh, a certain uh, process is better than, than the other process in terms of reducing prejudice, and you were to mandate that, right, uh, uh, as regulation, then it could lead to much better outcomes. So, so I, I'm just trying to understand what that uh, choice looks like. Yeah, so I, um, so you see some of this in the US where they make it illegal for you to, say, reveal nationality, race, um, sometimes age as well. Um, so you're not allowed to reveal that on the first application. Of course, at some point it's all revealed when you're in person, when it's not anonymized. Um, and I think the idea there is to try to strip away the first stage from any selection, strip away selection bias from the first stage. And focus only on stuff that really matters. The problem with that is, of course, that people just then, it's a classic omitted variable problem to the extent that there are correlations between other signals on the CV and those omitted variables, people load on those. So zip code becomes, oh, he's coming from Bronx. I don't, I, I'm going to guess he's black, right? Um, and the name, oh, that name is very African American. So it's a little hard to actually completely uh, anonymize the first stage. But I think the response has been to take away discretion from the gatekeepers uh, on the first stage. Um, and then there are a couple of other. Um, symptoms or indicators of bias. I'm not a big fan of the, well, 90% of your jobs go to whites and 10% to blacks, but 60% um, of your applicants are whites and 40% blacks. That could just be a, a, a matching issue. Uh, they're just not enough qualified blacks. So you need something more sophisticated than that. So, um, which is why, um, the, uh, we were planning to extend our, our particular research to, to try to see if we could get beyond this. And so we were planning to use like, um, I think, I don't even remember the paper. Did we use Dr. and Mr. Sanjana who's read it most recently might know this. But the idea was that um, if there was statistical discrimination going on, which means that, um, that uh, I have no bias against Muslims, but I know that as a group, they are poorer and have more volatile incomes than Hindus. Then uh, when I'm faced with two observationally identical tenants, Hindu and Muslim, I would uh, go for the Hindu merely because I have confidence in him being able to pay rent on time. So there's an absolute no bias. Uh, the Muslim is a perfectly nice chap. I don't know enough about the two of them. So in the face of this information asymmetry and because the group information becomes important to fill out this missing information, it's a noisy proxy, but it's a proxy. I say, all right, the Hindus are safer, not the Muslims. All right, so, uh, and in India, with all this issue around young males and terrorism, same thing. I have nothing against Muslim men, but a disproportionate number of them might be represented in terrorist incidents, and therefore I become very risk averse and say, I don't want to give out a uh, flat to Muslim men. So, I, it, I, it, it's a fascinating issue, this multi stage. Uh, screening process um, coupled with what point, uh, how does anonymity play out in the first stage? It's almost not going to be anonymous in the last stage. So, but it's in the first stages, you have some anonymity screens and whether that mitigates the problem or folks work around it by loading on signals that are proxies for group identity. All of that is, yeah, it's, it's a big design question and yeah, it's probably a big policy question, you're right. Great. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Sandra. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Professor, uh, you spoke about how uh, in India we cannot only view changes in terms of law implications and policy level implications without the social change. Having said that, how do you think, if at all, we have a well calibrated anti -discrimin housing discrimination law in India, given that we have successful models to look at in Canada and US? How do you think that will play out given the existing challenges of discrimination in India? Uh, it's a good question. I would say it will be good to have it on the books. Um, 
I um, so I guess the near, the closest example would be the, the recent Supreme Court judgment on Section 377. Yeah. So as usual, the way it play out, way it will play out is that uh, to the more uh, well connected, uh, outspoken, and able uh, metropolitan folks, they will have a recourse. I'm not sure how it plays out in rural India or small town India. Um, change has to start somewhere. So it's good to have it on the books because I think it does moderate the response of the state machinery from being openly prejudicial, uh, openly discriminatory, it can become a little more cautious in how uh, it is used. So, I mean, in discrimination, India is not all only peer to peer, it's enabled by the state machinery in many places. So in a sense that it is almost hopeless, a Muslim would, even with the law in the books, a small town, the Muslim would know that he went complain to the cops, they would not register the FIR. I could easily say cops saying, why are you making a fuss? There are plenty of flats in this locality where your folks live. In fact, I can call a broker, a friend of mine, and if you're so pressed for a flat, he'll get you a flat. It's just not the locality you want to go to, right? The police also playing that role. Um, and I mean, the question is, do you want to take it to a lawyer, take it to court with all the hassles involved, right? Um, so it is. Um, it has to be also social change. Uh, can't just be legal. If you mean change in outcomes, a uh, law in the books is not going to magically remove discrimination across the length and breadth of the country. It didn't do so in the states, uh, which when these laws went on the books was already a far more developed and wealthier society with a very large civil society uh, and a very active media. I mean, India has an active media, but it's not anywhere close to where the US was in the 60s also when civil rights went on the books. So there's still a long way from that. So I just think it's we must be practical about what this. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Um, my other question is, like you mentioned, you also wanted to understand traces of indirect discrimination, say uh, dietary choices, etc. So have you, uh, over the time, identified any more streams related to discrimination that you'd possibly like to research more on? So we've been, we have an approach to look at um, gender and the northeast. But um, that would be, in some sense, mimicking what we have done currently if we use the same uh, experimental technology, which is a blind web audit, uh, where we refuse to have any communication to keep it as clean as possible. It's also as limited, very limited then, because we don't know what happens once um, there's a face-to-face -face encounter. But we do, what emerged from our research, which is fascinating, is that there is a large parallel broker market. Um, and I think that's kind of rational. So it, it the, the the so a few things are probably true. Naive uh, Muslim tenant applicants in Delhi may try the mainstream websites, and they will very quickly find out that compared to their Hindu buddy in the next cubicle, say their call center, they are taking much longer to find a flat. Right? And given the sensitivities in India right now, they'll figure out religious discrimination. Um, if they talk to somebody more experienced, an experienced Muslim elder who lives in the city, he would say, why are you wasting your time doing that? There are certain areas where they rent to Muslims and there are certain kinds of landlords who rent to Muslims. I can get you brokers who talk to them. So these parallel markets appear. We talked about the ghettos and these parallel markets are actually a market response to discrimination, a rational response to minimize effort and search cost in the context of discrimination. We think they exist. We would like to study them more. Um, they could be through parallel broker networks. They could be through parallel platforms for advertising and matching. So I, I don't know, for instance, whether Shadi.com, which is I think one of the dominant matrimonial things in India, whether it also includes, there's a Muslim segment to that or the Muslims have their own matching matrimony side. So all of these parallel markets emerging and how structured they are, it's not necessarily the first best outcome for reasons we discussed because it, I think it costs us in economics and in, in economic growth and social cohesion, but it is a rational response. And so we wanted to kind of get to understanding these parallel markets, how they operate. Okay. Um, and uh, we'd actually even written a proposal. It did not get funded. So one of the reasons we stopped working on it for a while. Um, and I, I mean, frankly, I don't know whether the current regime, there's any, you might know better, there's any serious hope of laws on the book. 
um, but I'm going to not say very much more than that. It's kind of nice to know that you guys are, um, are working on this um, on a voluntary basis. Um, I think Nirat said something about a few thousand um, landlords who are open. Um, I would like, I should probably visit your website to see what that's about. Nirat, do you want to tell me a little more about that initiative? Yeah, essentially that's really uh, the heart of our housing service. We're trying to aggregate uh, inclusive homeowners, landlords, and the goal is to get to 10,000 by the end of the year. And we've launched a campaign called 10K Inclusive Landlords. Literally that. Uh, and if you look at uh, India, I think at least uh, if, if reports by Night Frank, et cetera, are to be believed, then we have about 23 million uh, housing units which are on rent uh, in urban India. That's in the uh, somewhat formal uh, domain and there might be some more in the informal domain. So, so even if let's say 1% of that comes online and that uh, in terms of inclusive landlords, then you can start uh, at, at some threshold, the matching starts to work, right? If you have too few, then the matches aren't there. Uh, so our goal is to get to about 10,000 this year, then maybe uh, grow it by four or five times next year. Uh, yeah. How do you know that the group um, that is signed on is truly inclusive? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think there's a, a, a self-selection in uh, place. So there's actually no incentive at all to sign up. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, in fact, it's quite tedious to sign up. We've kept the process not easy. Uh, you have to fill a form. Instead of uh, appifying it and making it one-click sign up, uh, we actually we require people to spend 10 minutes uh, and, and fill those things. And then be the team screens, uh, screens it uh, through a conversation. Uh, in fact, we've also had cases where we uh, people had signed up and then when we spoke with them, it became clear uh, that they were okay with everything except that, let's say, they wouldn't uh, want one identity. Let's say they won't want Africans or or they won't want people with non-vegetarian food preferences and then we had to just remove them from the database. Now, it is absolutely conceivable that uh, even through all of this, uh, maybe three, four, five percent of people slip through uh, because they maybe have not, uh, maybe they would like to believe that they are inclusive, but they're actually not. Uh, when push comes to shove uh, and presented with a real situation, they'd say no, uh, or, or maybe our team uh, got a false uh, positive. Uh, I think in that case, uh, we have a business rule saying that we would actually refund. If, if the transaction were to happen on our platform, we would then refund the fees that we would, uh, we would have taken from the home seeker in that case, and then obviously knock that person off the platform. I see. So you actually have a matching platform and you take um, a small fee from the applicant, tenancy applicant. Uh, so, so the idea is to actually just do the brokerage, uh, so to run brokerage services based on this. And I think we thought long and hard about uh, why should we just have a matching platform or should we actually provide end-to-end -end services? And at least the, car the standing hypothesis is that uh, the end-to-end -end services make more sense because it's not just uh, the house which is valuable, it's also the whole experience. Right now, humiliation and rejection are big negatives in this whole process. And, and people on the other side, if I'm a Muslim, if I'm somebody from the Northeast and African, what I'm also trying to optimize for is a comfortable a search experience, right? So when somebody handholds me and takes me to five different houses, so that's something we're trying to optimize for. This is fascinating. So you, um, the the reason you could have this five percent false positive is folks sign up even though they clearly don't want one or two groups because they it's just another market to tap into. They think you are doing the screening of good tenants. So you know, I mean, I could sign up on one of those big housing websites, which I use, for instance, for my research. Yeah. But there's almost no screening there. Now here comes a clearly well-educated group of people, very well-intentioned. They are screening on both sides. I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. If if we if they can, uh, yeah, exactly. So the value would be that we would have screened people in most cases. Uh, uh, for uh, decency, I mean, the signal also is that most of our tenants, most of our home seekers would be people from these identities. We would not typically have uh, others. Uh, yes, I don't know what the proportions look like, but I'm guessing that makes sense if there are costs to signing up with you on the demand side, on the um, tenancy side. If there are no, if there are few costs, then it's not clear to me that's true. But if there are costs, yes, um, there would be a... Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one is again self-selection. So we are only advertising in certain ways. I mean, we will advertise in certain ways. Right now, our focus is really to build this uh, threshold of uh, landlord. I mean, we, we did some very small, almost like a pilot experiment. We want to understand how this whole thing works. So we uh, did some uh, small marketing for a couple of weeks, got maybe 30, 40 leads. And we ran those leads without actually having uh, a supply in place. And then we discovered the problem. I mean, it was very intentionally done as an experiment. 
and now that we know what what challenges are uh, popping up and now we switched off all demand side uh, activity and then right now we just focusing on getting to that threshold where uh, at least uh, some matches will start happening this is only delhi or nationwide so we had started with delhi but now we are aggregating across across india oh, it's very cool uh, how are you getting the word of mouth out uh, almost entirely through influencers on social media and we're getting uh, the good news is that this is a fairly uh, newsworthy thing so we've already been written about uh, the many many stories coming out uh, so we got uh, featured in uh, newspapers uh, as prestigious as the straits times uh, in singapore so, so and then uh, in india uh, uh, papers like uh, caravan or uh, the wire uh, we have collaborations going also a lot of the word of mouth uh, is going to come through uh, through platforms we are creating so we are actually launching uh, the belong virtual uh, literature festival uh, which will be a three day festival with lots of authors who work on these things so those kind of things we already have like weekly book readings and and some fairly prominent authors coming so for instance at 5:30 today in the evening we have kavita krishnan reading her book so, so those kinds of things and then the word sort of gets out so it's very very uh, very um, organic and it is true that in the applicant pool you are seeing the mix you expected to see the disadvantaged groups uh, on, on the demand side yeah Yes, when we ran the experiment to get those thirty forty leads, uh, it was almost entirely the disruptive. These are the people who had struggled to basically uh, get a space in, uh, in Delhi. Very cool. Um, that's really cool. That's quite a lot of work in nine or ten months, and this is fairly. Um, I mean, work with direct impact. So well done again. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. I know we have a couple of questions still left. So Sanjana, over to you. No, I think we're almost done. So Nila, oh, if you have any other questions, you are free to go. so i have one or two then uh, if you don't mind uh, uh, vikram so uh, we've been really uh, we, i'd love to know from you what do you think is the value of uh, research networks when studying problems uh, which have so many different aspects right so you have the identity markers i think of them as columns and then you have these different spaces right so you have housing jobs healthcare education even things like representation maybe on who gets to be on a tv panel right so you got all these different situations uh, social interactions so so what's the role of networks uh, research networks uh, and if if you were to almost answer it through your own experience i mean what are the things that you could have done differently you would want to do differently if you had a network are there networks already in place uh, if yes do they do everything right uh, what could the research collective do which would be valuable to people uh, who are studying these problems so it's it's a very good question there's a lot of emphasis on interdisciplinary research so when you say research networks it need not only be a network of economists it could be a network of economists anthropologists sociologists yeah i'll first give you the problem with those um networks the problem is that the domains have um their own gestalt their own way of approaching a problem so sociologists and anthropologists are story based um lots of context lots of nuance economists want to boil it down to a uh, parsimonious model if possible a few key variables they say yeah it's it's super stylized it's um, obviously almost cartoonishly simple but this is the first order stuff the reason to model it is to make sure that we are not making a fundamental error because the intuition has gone wrong because math models have an internal logic so you will say that x causes y my model is saying it's not as simple as that uh because you anything can be labeled a theory say in some other other social sciences but here you have a little more discipline the problem is that so there's that different approach which is an issue but that's not the biggest uh, problem i've encountered in collaborating outside of my domain the biggest issue is that we have different publication uh incentives and thresholds so i want to submit to the aer american economic review so shall i want to submit to the american sociology review a policy science guy is the american administrative quarterly or whatever the format the timelines the way you write the paper the methods are acceptable are totally different so it is a very difficult problem to solve even when we are encouraged to form these networks or groups across disciplines for grants they want us to do that you have to negotiate ex ante who's doing what and where the output will be published because journals even you could you could conceive publish the same research project in two different journals or uh, two different domains but then journals don't like the idea that it's already published elsewhere so you have to prioritize 
So one of the things you'll probably notice across research collectives is that while there's fairly polite conversation and sometimes interesting conversation when you place a sociologist, an anthropologist, or a historian next to an economist. If you ask them to work more collaboratively in with greater intensity, it's going to be harder because they just have very different approaches and more importantly, very different incentives for publication. Academics are incentivized, especially younger ones for publications and the high flying ones come in two flavors. The grounded ones who you want to link up with because they have no attitude and they're generally open to stuff still and the others who are basically now on a seminar route and kind of talk route, right so you have that issue there so they're only concerned about okay is it a prestigious talk i'll give it how much are you paying me that kind of stuff so and the younger academics are actually the ones who are probably much more open to doing interesting research because they're trying to build up the research portfolios but they as i said are hemmed in to some extent by the by the constraints imposed by the publication process because they need to hit those quality adjusted publication quota before they get tenure or promotion in their universities. So there's that issue. Now, you just outline this kind of a matrix. You could think of an n-dimensional uh, matrix. You have the domains, the different uh, economic domains, uh, credit, labor, marriage, um, uh, transport, whatever, right? And then you have these um, different identities, group identities, and then you have these different technologies possible. All right, because that's another uh, dimension. And uh, but there's still, I think in a way, it's kind of a cross between an engineer and economist looking at a problem. Um, so uh, in all the cases though, good academics would look for common patterns across uh, domains. Uh, so identities and out and in identity, uh, with regard to the domain structure it as a marketplace with consumers and suppliers. Um, and look for common patterns to emerge and then tweak those depending on the context of the domain. So I think you would still want common stories which are applicable with some tweaks across different domains. I think what's a little less explored is technology because it's changing so fast uh, as it moves online. So there, and I think because of the 5G, 4G and the mobile phone penetration in India, in a decade, you're going to see a lot of the economic transactions move online, peer-to-peer -peer settings, business-to-peer settings, business-to-business -business settings. So I think that is something that you could probably flesh out a little more. It's not obvious you need researchers to do it, but it may be that some researchers specialize in certain kinds of technology formats. So there, I think it's useful, but I would not underestimate, just to re-emphasize the difficulty of having a research collective across disciplines. Within discipline, it's easier. So economists working on different markets, they will be more likely to talk to each other in the same language. But uh, across disciplines, harder, much harder, uh, despite uh, all the talk about. But within discipline, let's say economists working at different parts of that matrix, so you think there's value in yes. just uh, uh, fostering some collaboration? Uh, yes, that? and I would be surprised if, um, so the issue is really theme-based, with discrimination, there's no reason to believe. You may have a person doing a bunch of housing discrimination papers, but typically this person will also then move on to other markets eventually. So again, it's a, it's a model or a theory that's cross market in general. Um, it is possible that technology influences um, the way this plays out in different markets because different markets may be more amenable to different technologies. But I, I don't want to speak too much on that because I haven't thought about it in great depth. Um, there's probably value there in both theory and empirical work. Um, but um, how would you guys help? So, I mean, um, when you're rolling out your uh, housing initiative, you should have, if you had talked to some researchers, I don't know if you did, you'd probably have gotten um, some comments as to, you know what, maybe you should do this quasi experimentally. So not only do you have stories to tell for the media, but you could probably have rigorous evidence that there's a control group and a treatment group and some folk get assigned to the treatment group in your applicant pool. And they get matched up earlier and have much happier experiences exposed compared to folks who are randomly left out. Now, that's a choice you have to make. But you see, when you're designing these initiatives, you may want to tap into researchers and then you ask yourself, well, how much additional work does this involve? I mean, how much do I tweak the platform or the process? And what's the gain in terms of the additional evidence or evaluation of this thing? 
Uh, are there gains in terms of PR? Are there gains in terms of just building an evidence base and getting papers out? So it's um, it's something that you should probably yeah keep in the front of your mind that um, if I can use this, if I can get some evidence or insight while I roll out this process, um, it could be great. So uh, as an example, for instance, when uh, you see this a lot in smaller developing countries when they roll out um, schemes, they will often talk to researchers or researchers will try to insert themselves in the process and say, I know you want to cover all districts or all counties. Why don't you randomize your coverage across counties? You still get to all counties in three years, but now because you've randomized, I can say, look, the treated counties, the impact in year one compared to the untreated counties in year two and that kind of stuff. So, so that's just randomization. Uh, there could also be theoretical insights that could come from uh, researchers. I, I think that your design, uh, the way you describe it, it's very, it was very kind of uh, high level description, but on the face of it, it looks well thought through. So well done um, on the thing. I think you mix of trial and error intuition. You've got the design for the housing collective um, reasonably right. It's not obvious that it's the best design ever, but it seems to be working and it's reasonably well done. Uh, whether you have any evaluation of its effects. Um, people who signed up, they rent their flats out one month faster with no effect on rental streams. Um, just as good uh, flat return, just as good condition as otherwise. People who signed up as tenants, they get their flats. They get housing within two weeks compared to those who don't, who get take six weeks and it's a much less stressful experience. Right, on hedonic measures of how do you feel today after a day of house search, much better. So I don't know if you have those kinds of hard metrics um, for your thing. You have the stories, yeah? Yeah, no, we, we're thinking about those for sure. I, I think those kinds of, uh, those are the value propositions for both sides. So yeah, thinking about that quite, quite a bit. Great. Uh, then the last question, uh, Vikram, would be, uh, are there other centers of research such as the, uh, who we should get in touch with, other researchers you would recommend we get in touch with, just to uh, discuss uh, uh, the research collective, bringing them on board, speaking with them in the same way we're speaking with you? Uh, any maybe three or four centers um, that you recommend? Um, abroad, I have to think about this. There are active groups working on discrimination. Um, as a quick, uh, um, so, Speaking as an academic, when I approach a new domain, what I do is I look for a recent review paper in one of the more general interest economics journals, Journal of Economic Perspectives or Journal of Economic Literature. What you want to do if you're looking for international groups or uh, researchers or active is to look at who co-authored the recent review papers. The review papers serve as a very nice overview of most recent research, what's known empirically and theoretically. So it's a great way to, uh, for, I think in economics, where you're closest to is the research on discrimination. It doesn't have a language, economics doesn't have a language for identity or social capital or belonging like the other. Mm. It's a new thing for, uh, still a kind of exotic thing for economics. So discrimination, economics is studied theoretically and empirically. So you, I haven't looked at the last few years, but in the Journal of Economic Perspective, the Journal of Economic Literature, the periodic reviews of these themes. So you yeah. look at the co-authors, you can write to them and say, hi, I read your recent review piece. It's fascinating. I run this on the grounds initiative, trying to battle this problem. And do you know of centers worldwide or in India? In India, you would know better. You talk to Thorat, so he's one big name. There is um, Ashwini Pandey in uh, DU. So she would just talk to these people. They would know the groups in India. Um, but tapping into international centers, I can look that up for you, but I would yeah, just look up these recent reviews, look at the uh, references for recent papers and the co-authors of the reviews, write to them and say, um, I want to find if there are international centers they might be university based, they might be think tank based. Yeah. And uh, do you have any, because you started at Berkeley, do you have, and Berkeley is really, really big on this. Uh, are there centers there that come to mind that we should reach out to? Or? So, no, not immediately. There's SEGA, which is a global development center run by my advisor, Ted Miguel, but okay. it covers mostly bread and butter development problems. And it seems like the West Coast a version of, uh, of Triple IE and, uh, yes. you know, the J Paul. Things because that's all around the World Bank, Boston, uh, Cambridge group. So whether there's a center that's devoted to discrimination and that's largely rooted in economics, 
I can't say when I was there, I did not see anything. I saw people working, but it may have emerged. It may have emerged. So yeah, so um, I can, if I find, I, if I find something out, um, I can let you know. My co-author Shogato is much more plugged into this. He might know because he's the, he's Esther Duflo and Abhijit student. So they won the Nobel prize. So, and he's worked on discrimination. So uh, I don't know if you ever wrote to him, but he might I, be. Uh, but we will, we will certainly write to him. Yeah. So um, if I come across something, uh, I will let you know. Yeah. I would also say one more thing. Um, the whole field of big data, data science, um, I don't know what's happening in terms of discrimination. So I think mostly it is about gathering large bodies of evidence about outcomes uh, because there's just so much available on these platforms. But there might be more going on in terms of mechanism design, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, predicting who might discriminate or who might be a target of discrimination, even among the vulnerable groups. So there might be stuff going on there. I, I crossed my mind, I haven't looked at it again, but it has crossed my mind that there might be interesting stuff starting there. Okay, uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll look that up for sure. All right, we can th thanks very much. Uh, this was fascinating, and, and thanks for taking time. Um, I enjoyed the My conversation. pleasure. Good job. Well done with the with the belong thing. I will look up the website again and browse it more closely now for sure. Yeah. If you have any thoughts, please let us know.